So first of all, I just want, I'm Cindy Dash. I'm one of the co-owners of Changing Hands Bookstore. I want to welcome you to uh, the Newton First Draft, Changing Hands. It has been, in the past 18 months, this will be our second live event. Uh, we used to host over 400 events a year. Um, so it is actually very touching, honestly, to see people in here uh, together. Um, I also have to say thank you in advance for your patience uh, with our team because we are relearning our events muscle memory. Um, we're, we are streaming to many things and some things are working perfectly and some things are working fictionally. Um, so again, I just want to thank you for your, all your patience. Um, many of us <laughs> at my store right now have never host, worked here when we had an event. Um, so we are relearning many things. But I just want to thank you for coming out today. Um, it, it really is, it, it means a lot to see everybody gather again. You know, when I thought about this introduction of, of Gloria today, I thought, okay, I can tell you about all of her New York Times bestsellers, and I can tell you about the amazing career she had at Planned Parenthood, and I can tell you about all the leadership, but I think you all know that. So what I decided I wanted to do is I actually just wanted to say thank you to Gloria, because Gloria, you have paved the way for so many women to take the lead, to become leaders, um, to become kind leaders, to become thoughtful leaders, I wouldn't be where I am had you not done some of the work that you did. So on behalf of everybody in the room and everybody on Zoom, I want to thank you. And we are here today to celebrate your new book. So please join me in welcoming Lori Felt. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to say is I think bookstores are first responders and uh, are essential, essential to life. So I think we should give Cindy and Changing Hands a big round of applause. <laughs> thank you, thank you, for, thank you for helping us stay sane during a pandemic because we couldn't do it without you for sure. So I, I'm, I'm more than a little nervous because this is my first in-person event in a year and a half. <laughs> and thank you all so much for being here. I uh, wanna start with, with where I start in the book, intentioning. Hashtag intentioning. By the way, I always tell people, it's fine with me if you pull out your phone and start tweeting and posting. So just don't, don't, don't email, don't send, don't, don't hear your emails, but, but, uh, but please pass the word around about what we're doing here and what we're talking about. So, um, it was a beautiful Arizona day last January, a day that looked like this, except not so hot. It's just perfect. I was out hiking with a friend and I tripped on a little something and broke my wrist. I'd never had a broken bone before. And I realized afterward that I should have recognized it as an omen that I started calling last year the and bones, and it turned out to be the year of broken almost everything. Um, because it, 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 as soon as we had finished, the reason I had been in Arizona at that particular time was because Take the Lead had our last in-person event, which was a Power Up conference, uh, and it was fantastic. It was on, it was on Leap Day, because I had said it had to be on Leap Day because that was the most feminist day of the calendar. Uh, and, uh, I, and so we did that on leap day and literally the next day the world started closing down. And so the book that I had started to write about a year before that turned into not a totally different book, but certainly a much richer book in many respects because in this past year and a half, we have all experienced so much, so much sadness, so much grief, so much change, so much uh, new awareness, so much uh, of, of things that we've never experienced before. Some good, some bad, some just new innovations that, that occur. Because disruptions like a pandemic do this for us. It, it, it's, a, it's a time of disruption and it's a time of rebirth. And both of those are important for a variety of different reasons. So when I had started to write intentioning, and I had already invented the word intentioning, by the way, 
I'm waiting for it to appear in the dictionary. I'm hoping that it will be the word of the year next year. Uh, but I decided that it needed to be an active verb. There needed to be an active verb for the word intention, uh, not just a noun that sits there, but an active verb that says, we're doing it. And that's part of what we'll talk about. I had been interviewing women for about a year, and I knew in my mind that I wanted to write a book that would tell their stories and around their stories that I would create a new set of leadership tools that I could, um, could teach and share with women. Um, how many of you have read No Excuses or seen No Excuses? Some of you I know have, many of you have. I see because there are so many friendly faces here. I know you have. So the last book that I wrote was called No Excuses, Nine Ways Women Can Change How We Think About Power. And in it, I was exploring what I had found was one of the linchpins to why women hadn't reached parity in leadership in any sector. In fact, we were, we were just at 20, we were under 20% when I started writing No Excuses, uh, which is now about 10 years ago. And I realized that there's such different socialization between men and women around power. And our experience of power is so different and our uh, relationship with power is so different as a result that that was one of the reasons why we hadn't actually broken through. We had better education than men already, 57% of college degrees, by the way. Uh, we, the business case was clear that, that uh, companies that had more women in their leadership made more money. The uh, women were, had the power of the purse we were buying 85% of the consumer goods and products, or at least making the decisions for the family. And yet we were not using that power. Why? And so I found that if I could, if I could help women shift the thinking about power from the old oppressive narrative that we've been taught, which is about wars and fighting and scarce resources, and there's never enough, and if I take a piece, there's less for you, uh, that so I have to really just I have to fight you for my little piece of that pie that uh, there, there's a good reason why women haven't embraced that notion of power because we've borne the brunt of a lot of really negative aspects of it over the years and as soon as we could start talking about power as being a, a, like a hammer whatever you do with it it's you can break something with it or you can build something with it and it's what you do with it and so you can take that concept of power and turn it into being the generative and innovative and creative and positive idea of being the power to, the power to. And then when, when I would talk to women about this, I would see masks fall off of their faces. I mean, like as though they were masks. I mean, now we're really wearing real masks, but uh, then it was more like their faces changed and they became calmer and more open. And so I realized that this was something that needed to go beyond just my, what I could do. And I actually started being asked to do workshops using that theory and the nine leadership power tools. And I, well, you know, I would hear from women that they had made advances that they would not have done otherwise. So, well, it didn't take long before I then co-founded Take the Lead, a nonprofit organization with the mission of gender parity in leadership in all sectors by 2025. Why 2025? Do you know how long? Do you know how long that people say it will take in the U.S.? Anybody know? 70 years is the most optimistic. The World Economic Forum says it will be 150 to 300 years. So why do I say 2025? Well, number one, because I feel, I believe you have to put a stake in the ground. You have to be able to measure towards something. You may not get there, but you'll get further than if you hadn't. But honestly, I've been doing this work for a long time, as Cindy said. And uh, if I could live another 70 or 150 years, I would. But the odds are not real great, even with the best doctor in town who's here uh, to, to help me out. I don't think I could live that long. So, so we have to do it by 2025. So everybody OK with that? OK. All right, good. I figured we'd have a, a willing crowd here today. So as, as, as I worked with women and, and taught women over the last 10 years, what I also came to realize was that after I have helped women embrace their power and see power as a positive thing that they can use to advance themselves or to do whatever they want to do in life, that there's the next big question that has to be asked. And the next big question is the power 
to what? The power to what? To what end do you want to use that power? To what end? What is your purpose? What is your intention? Uh, how do you want to choose to use that power? So that was the inception and the, the concept that I started with, with this book. And then came not just two pandemics. Uh, there came the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I'm fond of saying and, and the, about the story of my falling in, on break, and breaking my wrist on that hike that uh, one of my favorite management and leadership aphorisms is, it's not the mountains that trip you up, it's the pebbles on your path. And uh, so in addition to, in addition to, uh, to that, uh, w well, there was this tiny little virus that has tripped us up in the last year. Can't see it, but it has, it has tripped us up in so many different ways. And following soon on its heels was a pandemic that has been part of American culture for hundreds of years, but is finally being recognized and given at least some of the due consideration it needs to be given, which is a pandemic of racial injustice. And thank you. As I started my, my, my path, as I started my own career path, actually in the civil rights movement, I learned two things from it. One was that the most important one was that people working together can change anything. And I still believe that, and that's why I really believe we can, we can achieve our goals. But the, um, the juxtaposition of those two enormous issues in our lives really made me rethink much of the context of intentioning. And I felt that I needed to start the book by setting that context and setting it in a way that it would be very clear that, um, that it's understood that women, as I'm working for women, I understand that women are not a monolith, that women are diverse, that women are intersectional, that women are, w w women come from a variety of different places and spaces and we need to be addressing all of that. And also there's always that question that people ask me, which is, and what about the men? You know, it's always kind of like that. And what about the men? And uh, so I included a chapter that's called, And What About the Men? And, uh, and, and, and I uh, conclude the book with, uh, with a, what I hope is a ringing call to action that is about movement building and is about that fact that people working together can change anything, but if people don't work together, we're gonna change nothing. And that what we do, each of us, is more than what we do. And only when we join together will we actually be able to achieve racial and gender parity in leadership um, in any of our lifetimes. So within that, there are nine leadership intentioning tools. Don't ask me why I always end up with nine. I'm telling you, it just organically happened again. And in, and in fact, they, it organically happened again that they divide themselves in much the same way that the original nine power tools divided themselves into, which are self-definitional tools, counterintuitive tools, and change leadership tools. So they, are, they, are, they, they range from things that help us to better understand ourselves to things that your mother told you not to do, but you should do to things that help you literally change big systems. So that's the, that's the overarching picture of what's in the book. And what I, I last, actually, um, I, did do, I did do one really fun program this past week. I mean, the book isn't even actually formally for sale yet. You realize that. This is, this is like pre-launch launch. This is, this is this what's so cool about it. The, the pub date is, is September 28th. So you all are way ahead of everybody else. I did have the opportunity this past week to do one event that would never have happened without the pandemic. And it's a good example of when I say it's, it's a time of rebirth as well as a time of disruption, because in a time of disruption, you have an opportunity to make changes you will never, ever, ever have at any other time. People have to think differently. 
they have to think differently and they have no choice. So for all of us, I mean, I remember way back in, in the day when I was talking about telemedicine and uh, to try to reach women in rural areas and everybody thought that was just a really stupid idea. Nobody was gonna do telemedicine. Well now, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I don't wanna have to go to the doctor's office and be in the middle of all those sick people. I like telemedicine. So, you know, we have to change when we have to change. So this past week, I had the opportunity to do a program that I would never had the opportunity to do without the pandemic, which was that the New York chapter and the Arizona chapter of the International Women's Forum, and I belong to both, were able to Zoom together to have a program. And, um, and, and so that was, the, and, and my guest was Tiffany Dufu, who is the intentional woman for, for a leadership intentioning tool number five, which is um, strike your own damn balance and don't listen to the man behind the curtain telling you you're not supposed to be happy, which I think women get all the time. We get that all the time. So Tiffany, the, the reason I wanted to include Tiffany, and I had already interviewed her like two years ago, before I mean, two years before even last year, was because of two things. Number one, she had written a book called Drop the Ball, in which she says, you know, when you, she just, you know, like, she goes through her own story as a woman of, have, of thinking that she had to be perfect and had to do everything and then realizing how many balls she could drop and still everything would be fine and her children would be fine and her life would be fine. And uh, the second was that I found that, that the women I had interviewed before the pandemic, I re-interviewed and I found that there were several different strategies. And one strategy was the women who just simply said, I have to just stand back for a while. I can't, I can't do this. I'm not doing this. I'm just going to, I'm going to stand back. I'm not gonna do what I said I was gonna do. I'm, I just have to do this. I wanna tell you, there've been a lot of babies born to those women. <laughs> um, the second group was women like a woman named, uh, a pianist named Marina Arsenevich, who literally turned her entire, she, you know, performers, could they perform? No. So she turned her home into a recording studio. She has been writing and producing mu uh, music like nobody's business. She has acquired almost 600,000 viewers on YouTube and, and, and Instagram. And she's just like a, she's just created a whole new way to do her work. <coughs> Tiffany Dufu saw the opportunity. She had started an organization called The Crew. CRU. And the idea of the crew uh, was to put together something sort of like Lean In Circles, only more carefully curated with eight women that were curated specifically for their interests and at the beginning, their location. Well, location no longer mattered. Tiffany has been able to grow her crew by leaps and bounds, has gotten $2 million in investments, and can hardly I mean, she just, she can't keep, she says she's drinking from the fire hose every day. And so the, these, these disruptions bring different reactions from different people and different people at different stages of their life will react differently for a lot of different reasons. So we, we, cover, we cover a lot of that. And when I re-interviewed the women I had interviewed initially, I was able to say, okay, so this is where you were two years ago. Where are you now? And, uh, and by the way, the, honestly, the one woman who particularly, I was so sad that she had really stepped back and had, she was not continuing with the business she had created. She, did, she was one of the ones who had a baby, but she has decided she is now going to go run for Congress in Texas. So, you know, things, things, things change, things change. Everybody, everybody rethinks stuff at times like this. So I wanna start with a question for you. And as you're doing this exercise, I will, um, I will start bringing the panel up because I am absolutely honored to have the most remarkable panel today of incredible people. And uh, so the, on your table, you have this flyer. And if there aren't enough to go around, just you can do this on pencil and paper, you don't need it, but you can also I have to remember to say this, you can also go to my website, gloriafelt.com forward slash intentioning, and you can download a free workbook that actually has all of, the, all of the exercises in the book there. 
So on the uh, back of the program is an exercise that asks the question, and to boil it down to only one sentence, what is the main insight that you got during this pandemic time? What is the main insight that you got during this pandemic time? So while you all are thinking about that, I'm going to ask our illustrious panel to come up to the front, and I'm going to ask, see if somebody can, oh, great. Let me, uh, let me just get my stuff. Excellent. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. All right. You know what? I for we forgot to decide where we were sitting. You can sit wherever you want. Okay. All right. You sit here. You sit there. All right. Fantastic. Okay. So, let's see if I can... <laughs> This here, this here, okay. All right, this is what I also always forget to do and have to do. Make sure I take my own picture of the amazing crowd. Good, okay. All right. So, so um, I thought maybe, you know, if, if like three of you would like to share what your, what your answer was to that question. Would anyone like to just, we'll take three quick comments. Carrie. Listen to yourself and trust yourself to make decisions. Woo, that holds for all time. <laughs> all right, anyone else? Two, all right. Learning about learning about your self worth and how you can be more intentional. Yay! Use, you're, you're intentioning already. Okay, about everything, work and home and every place else. One more. Yes, hi. Heather. Hi, Gloria. Hi, I'm Heather. Um, and I know you know that. But, um, <laughs> but I, what I learned is I have limited emotional capacity, and it's okay to turn something off. Uh, it's okay to disconnect from Facebook, disconnect yeah. from source. It's okay to disconnect. How many of you have found that to be one of the things that you, that seems to be a fairly, yeah, a lot, I think a lot of people figured that one out. I'm not sure I figured that one out yet. <laughs> I think, I think I'm still on social media way too much. And, uh, as some of you can attest to my 3 a.m. emails and stuff. So, uh, well, so I want to thank all of you fabulous panelists for being here today. I want to give, I'm going to introduce all of you up front so that we can just hop into the conversation and won't be interrupting it once we get there. And you can tell people more about yourself too. I'm only gonna tell you what I know that you publish, okay? <laughs> All right, although I do know a few things about some of these people. I will also tell you that each person on the panel has some relationship to take the lead in addition to being a fabulous friend. And um, I, I, I will start with Alicia Ontiveros here. Uh, Alicia is a filmmaker, a writer, a producer, and her company is called Veros Productions. She, she looks at the intersection of truth, heritage, and ritual. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask her to talk a little bit about that and, uh, and particularly in regard to one of the leadership intentioning tools, which is clang your symbols. So we'll get into that. We'll get into that momentarily. Um, Felicia Davis is so many things, I can't even list them all. She's an author, she's a certified coach, she founded the Black Women's Collective, she uh, is a leadership ambassador for Take the Lead, she has been the lead trainer for three of our um, 50 Women Can Change the World in, in nonprofit organizations. So we've been working together a lot for a lot of the years. She also was the initiator and ha this has been the, the brains behind our new Take the Lead Academy for Advanced Leadership, which you'll be hearing more about as time goes on. And most important, Felicia is a great human being and a great friend and a person of huge integrity who I admire. And she's kind of my North Star when I'm trying to figure something out. So she's, she's, she's yeah, 
you need to know Felicia. Catherine Scrivano is well known to many of you, I am quite sure, because she has won almost every honor in this town. I, I don't know if we can think of another one. She's been the outstanding woman in business. She's been the, one of the most influential women in Arizona. Um, What's really cool is that she founded, which is this is not something that many women have done. She founded a financial company, and this is this is rare for women. And I want you to talk about that and how that all went and um, what you learned from that. The tagline of her company, Casco Financial Group, is "We believe you don't have to be wealthy to be wise," which is really cool. So uh, Catherine Scarbano is also a member of the Take the Lead Leadership. Amb uh, uh, excuse me, the, we've got too many acronyms here. The Take the Lead Arizona Leadership Council and has been a member of it since I think we started. And it was her idea to have this event. So I want to say thank you, Catherine, for, for making this happen. <laughs> uh, Veda Manager, Veda, uh, is the founder and CEO of Manager Global Holdings. You know, I, I used to have a friend who said that our, the name we're born with helps to determine what we do in life. And that certainly is true of you, right? Although I never be a CEO. It, well, yeah, well. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, Veda is on several corporate boards. Um, he, I met Veda first when he was maybe 10 years old and was an advisor to Rose Mofford to get the first woman governor of Arizona, Rose Mofford. And he also has been an advisor to the first uh, African-American mayor of Washington, D.C., Sharon Pratt. So Veda, Veda covers the waterfront of business, politics, and um, is almost as bad a social media fiend as I am. He's also one of the men who exemplifies the, uh, the, the what about the men chapter, and that he has always been an, not just an advocate, but a stand-up person who has visibly and uh, forcefully and helpfully supported women in a variety of different ways. I don't use the word ally. I like to use the word partner more. I feel like that's more equal in my, in my terminology. I know ally is kind of the, kind of the word of the day. But uh, let's, let's hear it for the panel, and then I'm going to ask them some questions. All right. All right. So, um, Felicia, I'd like to actually start with what the, the piece of the book that, that weaves together racial and gender equality. And I'd really appreciate it if you would talk about your perspectives on how we can do a better job of that, uh, maybe what company, oh, I forgot to mention that Felicia is also a former corporate HR VP. So she's got, she's got that, that expertise as well. What do you think we could do both as individuals and as companies to recognize the intersectionality of gender and race in getting to leadership parity? Well, that's a great question. I think that, you know, one of the first things to your point individually and collectively is individually, we have to really look at um, how we have been um, harmed, if you will, by the inequities and really understand like what is that tied to? Because until we can really go back and have a connection to how we got our frame of reference around race, gender, and that sort of thing, it's gonna be impossible to really um, heal it, right? Because a lot of this work, it, it's really impossible to really go in and fix it until we really focus on healing it. So I think that's the first thing that we have to do individually is really understand what is the con connection? How did I get my perspective about race and gender and those sorts of things? And how has that shaped me as a leader today in terms of how I show up as a leader, how I support other people in, in, in different, uh, who are different from me, right? And then once we do that, then we have to do our own healing. So there's a couple of different exercises that I really encourage the women in, in, in my community to do in terms of doing their own inner healing is really having those conversations, very powerful, but can be sometimes tough conversations and not, not conversations just only within our, our own circle, if you will, but expanding those conversations to people who do not look like us so that we can get a better perspective around why they show up the, the way they do, right? And then that's when the healing can start, right? And sometimes you may even have to go as far as, as really understanding, okay, who do I need to forgive? 
And sometimes that forgiveness is not someone else. Sometimes that forgiveness is the person in the mirror, right? It's then and only then can we start to really go out and say, okay, now collectively, what can I do? What can I do looking outside of myself? So when it comes to the companies, companies need to, need to be more open to having these conversations. Whether it's allowing someone one in to come in and facilitate those conversations in, in small circles, if you will, but be open to having powerful conversations because only then will things start to change. As long as we continue to either deny it, ignore it, try to cover it up, tell people to get over it, it's impossible to just get over it. Because when what there's a book that called there's a book that, that's called The Body Keeps Score, right? And what happens when you have trauma, it, it impacts you viscerally, right? And, and what that means is, especially when it comes to the corporate piece, when you talk about bias and, and, and belonging, whenever someone feels like they don't belong, our body and our mind register that as trauma. They, it registers that as trauma, right? And until you've done that healing to really deal with it, you, the cycle is going to compete, uh, repeat, repeat, fight, flight, freeze, fight, flight, freeze. That cycle will repeat. And so that's why it's important that companies start having these powerful conversations around this and really, really how it affects us viscerally. Then we can really start to build powerful relationships across the organization. So I want to tap that into the leadership intentioning tool number one which is uh, ha having had a similar experience myself, it, it not having to do with, with race, but having to do with religion uh, and, and, and being raised as one of the few or sometimes only Jewish kid in town in, the, in school, it's like I learned to cover myself. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's that same thing. You, 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 you cover yourself yes. when you feel like you can't be who you are. Yeah. In a, in, and that takes an enormous amount of psychic energy. Uh, it's a huge amount of psychic energy. Does. So the first thing we have to do is uncover uh, ourselves. We have yeah. to uncover ourselves. So that's the, thank you for, you, yeah. you made a great tie-in for me there. Yeah, that was, that was great. Uh, um, Alicia, can we move from that to clang your symbols and the relationship? I, one of the, one of the most useful pieces of leadership knowledge that I received early on in my own career was, was the late Warren Bennis, who used to say, the first responsibility of a leader is the creation of meaning. And symbols are such a huge piece of that. And the work that you do helps people to understand through the use of film and stories and symbols. So would you talk to us about that and how you see that that can be used as a leadership tool? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I think that film and television is both um, reflective of who we are, but it can also help us imagine who we can be. And I think it's really important to always keep those in equal weight when we, when we are, are consuming media. And um, when you introduced me, you talked about the three themes that I try to focus on in my work, ritual, heritage, and truth. Um, and I won't take, talk a lot about those today, but those are symbols that I, um, came to understand to be important to me through a lot of intentioning, even if I didn't know that I was doing it, um, at a turning point in my life when I was really questioning, like, what the hell am I doing with my life? Mm -hmm. And how do I want to show up in the world? And at, around that point, I had the honor and privilege to be selected to attend your 50 Women Can program in media and entertainment, and which really helped me, um, as we were learning about the first nine power tools, um, figure out you know, who I was and how I wanted to show up. And through that long process, I came to understand that those were themes that were important to me. And so now I can reflect that back on my website and through my work and the projects I develop, how I show up in the world. And I encourage all of you to also, you know, ask those same things of yourself. How are you showing up? Why are you doing the work that you do? And what about you makes how you do what you do unique? Um, what specific piece of the puzzle do you hold that nobody else holds? And I try to, I try to really um, reflect that through those themes and, and through my podcast is where I talk about my work and kind of bring people along in my film and TV uh, journeys. 
which you can find, it's called unsolicited with Alicia on Tavares if you want to look it up. Um, but another symbol, you know, we, we show up symbols um, in, in who we are and how we dress, how we talk, and words are so heavily symbolic. And the aha moment that I tease Glory about wanting to share with you today that I'm now going to get to is um, there's a phrase that I realized, you know, when a good book, and I read Gloria's book, I was so excited. Um, every time I get into a good book, you know it's good when it kind of gives, it transports you into like this trance where you feel you have aha moments and then right. you just have to write them down as quick as possible. Um, that's how I know it's a good book. And I had so many of those. And this is the, this is the aha moment I'm about to give to you today. <laughs> At somewhere in the, <laughs> in the course of the book, I realized that there's a phrase that we say all of the time. I think that you've probably said it multiple times in the past month, couple of weeks, maybe this week. We say it all the time. And we, we have good intention behind it. Um, we, we say it because we're trying to help somebody. But I think that at best, it is useless and at worst it is diminishing and it is dismissive mm. um, and these two words we usually say these to people when they're coming to us telling us about something that they're doing that they're inten when they're intentioning when they're telling you about a big thing that's happening in their life when they're trying to carve a new path or start something new mm -hmm. we say these two words all of the time does, does anybody have like a guess at what they may be comes like the end of the conversation. Oh, that's so great. I'm so happy for you. That, that. What is it? You say, what, what do we say? I should. No. It's like you're trying to give it to them. That's so great. Good luck. Yes. Good luck. Good luck is useless. It's, I am inviting you to fuck luck because it's no good. And I did not ask Lori if I could cuss, though. I'm probably going to but it's good, you'll remember it, fuck luck. And I, the several times since I decided that I was going to, fuck luck, I have almost said it to two people who were going on courageous journeys and I had to stop myself. I said it once and I was like, no, stop, I'm sorry. Strike that, reverse it. I do not wish you good luck. What I wish you, what, what I said was, I know you have everything that you need. It's gonna go great. Everything that you need is going to happen, is going to be there for you. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I don't like luck is like the people who are uh, at a bifurcation point in their life, at a, like a critical point, don't need to be reminded that they're not in control, mm -hmm. that they somehow need to, 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 to hold on to luck. No, um, and I'm not saying that luck is not an important part of things. It is. Um, there's, seren there's serendipity in life that you can't expect in that. But here's what I do know. The universe is in charge of luck, and the universe rewards courage. So what we need to do, instead of saying good luck, is to help people be courageous. Mm -hmm. So instead of telling someone good luck, and you're going to be so tempted to do it, I hope you remember this, instead tell them something else. Tell them that you believe in them. Mm -hmm. Tell them that they have what it takes um, to do the thing that they're trying to do. And you, you're going to say it, and then you're going to also want to add good luck at the end. Don't do it. And if you do, explain why you think it's bad, because then you're helping to spread the message. That's what I did when I, when I almost said it. And I almost said it to somebody who was literally dropping her entire career to start a, a nonprofit organization to help bring equality in the insurance industry. Mm. And she, we were talking about me joining her board. And we were just, just talking about it and having a conversation. At the end, I, I almost said good luck to her. And I was like, hell no. I'm not telling this woman good luck because I, what I wanted to tell her is that I was so proud of her for taking the leap and that she was going to learn and grow so much and go places she can't even imagine and that she has everything that she needs and that her determination, her persistence is going to be what makes the difference for her. So I think that if we can do that, we can you, you know, spread. That is symbology. You are helping somebody carry something really important when you do that. Mm -hmm. So that is my aha moment. That goes into the lessons. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. So, Veda, what about the men? Um, <laughs> well, I don't know how I can follow that. <laughs> that, that, was, that was good. And, and actually, it's emblematic of being here today because it's about reciprocity and about learning things. So I've actually just learned something that now I will adopt in my life about not saying good luck and encouraging and, and finding something else 
and resisting that temptation. That's great. So I'm honored to be here today, humbled to be here today, uh, honored to be mentioned in the book and what about the men uh, in that chapter. Uh, I also want to be emblematic of the fact that uh, women can influence and be mentors to men. I've known Gloria for a long time, known her spouse Alex for a long time, uh, while I was a student at ASU back in the 70s when I arrived here. And Gloria's example of leadership and gender and advocacy and always fighting for what's right and also conveying that message to other people has been influential to me. A friend of mine had just became the new chief marketing officer for the WNBA. Uh, his former colleague of mine at Nike where I was an, uh, an exec. And he said something very important to me which actually fits what we're talking about today is that we were talking about how he was going to make the WNBA more marketable, gain a larger market, et cetera. And the natural assumption would be that obviously you want more young girls to play basketball and be involved in sports. But no, he said, actually what I'm really after is that when young boys are wearing WNBA uniforms and emulate Diana Taurasi and Sue Bird, and those are the heroes as equally as LeBron James and others, that's when I know I've succeeded. So, those kinds of things all contribute, I think, to a better society. There's no discomfort in me being here. I lived in multi-generational households where I was raised by, in the same, under the same roof with a great-great-great-grandmother, a grandmother and a mother all at once. So I, I had women ministers, Reverend Margaret Lee, Reverend Myrtle Moore, Reverend Donna Roddy, remember them well, the lessons they taught. So no discomfort in being here and being able to convey how important leadership in women is in, in this society. Um, and Gloria's embodied that. Beta, I notice in your own bio, you also say that you are a young woman dad. Yes, so let's, we, let's, not, let's not leave out no, the, no, yeah, no, that no, generation, my, yeah. My what, what Charlene, you've, and what you've done, what oh, you've yeah, done to, to, to help, to help to, women. And yeah. I watched how differently yeah. the women elected uh, officials I was treated, how differently mm -hmm. they were treated than the men. Mm -hmm. So that also was Im impactful, being able to help them, both uh, DC Mayor Sharon Pratt and, um, and Governor Rose Marford. And I had women influential in my arrival in Arizona. You know, I see, you know, I see people here. Um, uh, Brenda Smith, who was very, very important. Um, I see Cassandra, you know, who was involved in the political. So I've had lots of women influences in my life. So it's important for me then to take that energy back in, in, in a reciprocal sense. Not as good as what you did with luck, but. <laughs> And I thought the phrase you were going to when you said we say something more than that, I thought it was going to say you're on mute. Well, I, I thought that was going to be the phrase more than the other, but that's the other thing I think it may be overtaking good luck uh, these days. But I've had these great influences and have tried to reciprocate energy in the women I've mentored. I sit on corporate boards, as, as Gloria's mentioned, and have made sure that the boards that I sit on also have women members and who could be impactful women members on publicly traded companies. So I've lived in the Middle East, in the UAE where actually surprisingly the UAE gets a bad rap or the, the Gulf in general for not having women leadership. But in fact, they figured out that we're at a competitive disadvantage in the world economically and otherwise if we leave 50% of our population behind. And so I've been impressed uh, in Abu Dhabi and, and um, in places where I've lived and worked that they figured that out. They've had women in leadership there and are encouraging through their MIT partnerships and things like that how to be sure they can intentionally and intentioning uh, get more women leadership in their structure. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. you, you I was going to ask you for tips and you gave them all. So <laughs> you did it without even being asked uh, how, of how men can be, be partners. So uh, Catherine, uh, I am hoping that you will talk to us about, no, I'm intentioning that you, <laughs> that you will talk with us about the impact of women getting or not getting equal pay. I know that you've done a lot of personal advocacy and work in that arena. And from your perspective as a woman in the financial industry, which can't have been an easy road, and maybe you'll share some of that experience and learning with us, um, what, would you, what would you like women to understand about the importance of getting equal pay, how to get equal pay, and why it's, why it's important for women to build wealth and not just um, think about what's in their paycheck. 
Larry has taken this huge risk of ending the panel with the numbers, nerd. Um, <laughs> but here's the good news. I now have permission to use all the words because, yes, I, I hate limiting them and, like Gloria, sometimes just have to invent them. So, uh, you know, the, the impact, not just for women, but for our community is, bear with me with some numbers, if women in general are making 80 cents to every white male's dollar, that means we are spending 20% less on our homes, our childcare opportunities, uh, we're saving less. We are more likely to be dependent. Uh, and we also live longer. We tend to take a break in our career to care for family. There's a whole lot of numbers that affect women individually, but think how that affects the community. Are we buying as many things? Are we supporting great causes? I know several nonprofits and important um, undertakings in this room right now, and you're going generally to women asking for donations and support, but they're only making 80 cents to the dollar. There's an impact in their ability to support. So our entire community is affected. Um, a little bit about me personally, I certainly had to look back and go, oh, that's what happened. Uh, my father died when my mom was 31 years old. And she had a very clear life path to be a wife and mother. And all of a sudden, she was sole support of two little girls and had no uh, expectation, no preparation, and had to figure it out. So as Gloria was talking earlier about how do we use a hammer, money is a tool just like a hammer. And my mom's ability to support these little girls with the expectation that what she should be doing is looking for a husband. Um, I'm very proud to say that my mom did remarry, but not till I was out of the house. She had a job to do. And she, she got that done. Somehow, I was only eight years old, and yet it impacted me, and I was able to see what the struggle was. I promise you that it was hard, and that she made a lot of missteps, but she figured it out. And no one said, good luck. They, uh, there was even a conversation at one point about uh, who would my sister and myself live with, because certainly we couldn't live in a home with only a, a woman in charge and trying to figure out how to make a living. So that's the foundation for me. And again, I certainly didn't realize at eight years old that this would become the spark for my life's work. But in looking back, I recognized that that's where it lay. So um, another one of those uh, just fortunate moments was I was proposing to the city of Phoenix that they conduct some uh, just financial, basic financial awareness classes through their parks and recreation program. And the woman responded and said, well, we already have someone who does that. And I just pulled it out of the air and said, yeah, but mine is addressed to women. And she said, oh, we don't have anything like that. And all of a sudden, I'm now rewriting my material to focus on women. And guess what? There was a lot to say. One of our most popular workshops uh, used to be called it's how long, how long ago it was that I started this one. It used to be called My Husband Always Handled the Money and was directed at recent widows or divorcees who suddenly were saying, I have to write a check and the lights are turning out. Oh, I'm supposed to do something about that. And there was a huge audience. I'm very dismayed to say there was a huge audience. I am thrilled to tell you that probably 20 years ago, we changed the name to My Spouse Always Handled the Money and acknowledge that either uh, person in the relationship, uh, it, it's not gender-based, it's just the ability to take on that undertaking within a, a household chores. A lot of times there's a division of labor, one, part, one partner manages the money, one partner doesn't, so we're bringing those along. Uh, but the, the impact to us individually, think about us as women, we're spending less, we're not able to buy as expensive a home, we're not saving as much, it affects our social security benefits. Think of it more broadly, but in the very beginning, what we need to do is expect to be paid equally and be prepared to negotiate. Mm -hmm.
from the very moment we start our career, we actually kind of put a stake in the ground to which all of our future financial experiences are going to be pegged. So to the younger women in the room, please, please, please trust me. You have to have negotiation skills on that very first day of your very first career. And it'll, it'll make a difference the rest of your life. If you are mid-career, start preparing yourselves for your next conversation about compensation. There are so many ways to approach it. Again, here in this room, we have resources, the YWCA, has uh, courses on uh, salary negotiation. Fresh Start, my friend Jen over there, she's the wrangler of all the mentors at, at Fresh Start. They offer classes on salary negotiation. And I think it's chapter two in the book, gives some resources. So if you're doing some research on your, uh, on your own, there's some availability there. This is critical that we have to go in from the very beginning expecting to be compensated equally. Everything else will fall in place after that and we'll make our own damn luck. Yes. Yay. <laughs> All right, can I get a time check from someone so I know how long we have to take questions? What time is it? It's what? 10.43. Ooh. It's 10.43. Oh, we're, we're supposed done. to be done. Can we take like two questions or three questions, Cindy? Is that okay? Oh, we started a little late, so we can take. Oh, so we can take a few questions. All right, great, wonderful. Well, you've got an amazing panel here, so and let's not waste time. Whoever has a question, raise your hand. Let's do it. No questions. We'll move on. Okay. All right. Whoops. Okay. Yes. I'll get you next, Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. experience things in our workplace and we carry those throughout our career. As a 54 year old woman, I know I look like I'm 40, but <laughs> when the pandemic came, I started evaluating my work in my workplace. Before, I wouldn't say, I'm worth more. I have been there for a while. I need more money or uh, advancement. What would you, what the path, what would you your advice to me as this 14 years, well, 18 years at community college, 14 years at the university, it's like that retirement coming, but I'm not retiring. How can I re-evaluate and move forward into a leadership role um, and also allow the experience that I experienced not to affect that? Mm. Mm. Let's take that. I know it's deep. Yeah, that's, that, is, that is deep, yeah. Lisa, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, so it sounds like you're asking, what do you need to do in order to be able to move forward within, whether it's within that, within the current organization outside so that you can earn more? Is that the question? Earn more, and also, I know that leadership is in me, mm -hmm. and I want to be able to- Oh, you want to be able to step into leadership. Yes. Okay. And how do you do that at this late, not late in life, I don't never say yeah. that it's never late. Yeah. How yeah. So I think the first thing that, that you have to I'm glad that you acknowledge that it's not to nothing to do with age, right? Uh, it's more around how you're positioning what it is that you want to do. So I would say that one of the first thing that you want to do is I always tell women to look for uh, what's missing in what I call the organizational white space. And the white space is a place where there is an opportunity that no one else is addressing, right? In addition to being able to talk about what that opportunity is, you also may need to be able to talk very powerfully around the impact that you've already been able to have. Whether it's in a leadership role or not, doesn't have anything to do with titles. If nothing else this pandemic has showed us, shown us is that titles mean nothing, right? To your initial question, Gloria, what you asked them about, I would say my biggest insight that I've gotten from this pandemic is that creativity is much more important than certainty. So if Say you that can again, go, that is great. That goes on a slogan. Yeah, creativity is much more important than certainty, right? We're mm -hmm. always looking for certainty to be able to do something. I gotta be sure, I gotta, right? But until you can really open up your mind to get creative, think creatively, think expansively, what can I do to step into the gap? How can I bring this experience that I have into this gap 
to solve a problem, be a problem solver. So really start thinking very, very expansively around what problems you can solve and how what you've already done adds value to being able to solve that problem. And then be able to have those powerful conversations. You know, when I, when I always say there are three things that you must be able to master no matter where you are in the organization, in your career, your reputation, re your relationships, and your results. If you can really focus on those three pillars, like ascension, no matter where it is you wanna go, ascension will never ever be a problem. So I, I say first start there, look for what's happening in the organizational white space, where there's a problem that you can tap into that no one else is focused on. Go back and bring all of your experience, bring your experience and the, and the results that you've been able to have, and then go have a powerful conversation with the person who can help you, um, help you, um, get into the next role. Gloria, if I can add maybe to that. Okay. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, I was at a memorial service recently, and one of the sayings is they were describing the individual who had passed away, uh, who had Southern background was, it's a poor rat that only has one hole. <laughs> and meaning that it, you've got multiple streams of income, you've got multiple ways to monetize your skill set mm -hmm. and things. And, and actually, I even experienced this myself. I never became more valuable as an advisor and executive at Nike as when I took on some outside consulting work mm -hmm. and also some outside board work, some of which compensated me, but some that didn't. So I would say take a good candid assessment of your skills, figure out if there are things that can be monetized in that skill set, monetize those, and it's amazing how then people where you are then kind of figure out, oh, obviously, uh, you're bringing some additional value here. There are things that you can do that not only benefit your income, but your progression in your career. But that's something to think about as well. And I know that Gloria's got a lot of resources in the book and other resources available to figure out how you can best monetize your extracurricular skill sets. Great point, great point. Bob, you had a question. Yes, I do. The, uh, it seems, what I, I think I see is that there are plenty of women who opt for, I'm going to marry this guy and live happily ever after. And they're going to stay home because they still can these days. And then they don't run the checkbook. The guy does. How do, you, how do you make the, how do women, that, how do people make the choice to give up the Their economic power? Economic power. Ooh, power. That, is, that is a huge one. That is just huge. Uh, Catherine, do you, ha you have an observation about what, what is it? And, and I'll I, respond. I, I, I don't have a, a, I think it's definitely very situational. Uh, in my experience, I'm thinking of that model being one that tends to be passed down generationally. Mm -hmm. Younger women are less likely to have that kind of vulnerability. Uh, I'll tell you in our household, my family is a pool deal. Guess who takes care of our swimming pool? If he's not around, that thing's going green. And it's <laughs> all the of all the if I'm gone, chances are good the lights are going to be turned off and he won't know what to do in the dark, except we have what we call our monthly money meeting where we just get together, exchange information that is necessary, pat ourselves on the back and go celebrate. It's, it's not a matter of who's in charge, it's not power over, it is power to. And by the way, I still don't know how to take care of the pool and have no interest at all. <laughs> but it, it's, I, again, I think it's kind of a, a decision within relationships. I personally could never be that vulnerable. I just, I can't even picture being as vulnerable as the people that you're describing, but it is a fact. Yeah. I, yes, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say really quickly that I see a lot of people um, in my generation of my age, and I'm in my late 30s, um, women who are career women getting to the point where they wanna start a family and then realizing that they can't do both or can't maybe be the parent that they want to be and have a career too, and so give that up so that they can take care of their kids more in a more dedicated way. And so I think our society really needs to bolster um, mm. 
parents and, and have like equal opportunity to a lot of things, including time off when children are born, um, child care services and acceptance of working mothers and 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 allowing and and allowing for men to be primary caretakers and and that being a powerful thing for them to do um, and a lauded thing for them to do. Um, so I think that's a big factor. Thank you. That's a, Thank that you. is an important good answer. I'd like to introduce you to my daughter-in-law, whose husband, my son, is an equal caregiver. If he had ever used the word babysit, she would have <laughs> smacked him in the head, and I'd have testified on her behalf at the trial. That, that would never happen. So the, the uh, expectation of equality within parenting yeah. and just taking care of the home. I think that's a much yeah. better answer than the one I huge. gave. It's critical. Uh, Carrie, I want to get to you just a second. I just want to add one thing to the answer to Bob's question, which is in our society, money and power are almost synonymous. And so everything you say about power holds for money as well. And, uh, and, and, and what's always been interesting to me in, in the philanthropic world is that when, you know, in, in my own experience, and I think some of the other nonprofit folks may, may be able to verify this, but I have found that uh, a, a manifestation of that is that women are really worried about giving money beyond what's in their purse. Uh, men can give money from their assets without worrying about it because they have always been socialized to know they can earn more. And women are still, we're, we're getting there, we're getting there, and each generation gets better. Uh, but you have to know that you can actually be in control of money and wealth in order to be able to want to take that power to yourself and to utilize it well. So, uh, oh gosh, we have lots of hands up. Uh, Carrie had her hand next, and then David, and then I think that's going to have to be the end of it. So, I just had two comments to respond to Bob. Okay. It's not always the woman who gives up even on the power. <laughs> Sometimes it's the man, and they're stuck in the role of the previous uh, generational identity of men as profession only. And so I just wanted that balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the second comment I had was for Alicia, because I, I feel what you hit upon was something very important, and that's where diversity matters, and what we bring to the table of our knowledge of other ethnicities and cultures, because sometimes there's a word, whether it be an African word, a Spanish word, of something they've already identified from their culture, that has not made it into the American English Dictionary, just like Gloria's new word, intentioning. And so in the French culture, it is normal to say not bon chance or good luck. It is more normal to say courage. Oh, no courage. Uh -huh. So you identify yourself as French, <laughs> <laughs> that's another a lineage in my heritage that I think it's, there. it's somewhere it's in there. <laughs> okay, uh, I think Dave Nichols, you're going to get the last last uh, question. So, what have you seen from the Generation Z right now that's getting in the workplace? What kind of movement are they creating, and where do you see them going, and how are you helping? So um, who wants to, does anybody particularly want to, to take that one? I mean, I, I do think things get better with each generation. And I think that the, gener that the, the, the younger generations um, are much more, much more open, much, much, more, uh, much more diverse, much more intersectional in all kinds of different ways and don't even think about it sometimes. Don't even think enough about it. Don't, yeah. yeah, I have a thought about that. So, um, I think we need to be careful with ourselves and with younger people, especially those who have been very vulnerable to the past year, um, in making sure that we help them cultivate an abundance mindset mm. and not get stuck in a scarcity mindset. So you can do a lot of reading about abundance versus scarcity mindset, but for sure we've all been in a scarcity mindset for at least a year, a year and a half. Um, just from the time everything shut down and we didn't know if we we're gonna be able to get enough food or have our jobs or 
all of that, that was scarcity. For a whole year, we were just stuck in scarcity mode. And then now we've slowly started to come back. And I think that we really need to be careful with ourselves and how we reflect back to those young impressionable people about how to think in an abundance mindset. And all the things that, you know, we've all been encouraging you to keep in mind requires an abundance mindset to, to believe that you can become a leader, to ask for more money at work, to be able to share, you know, um, responsibilities at home equally. Like there has to be abundance in your mind for it to be reflected in your reality. So I think that's really important for the young people. Yeah, no, I would agree. I, I think the younger people that I'm seeing, uh, particularly in younger brands and the clients that I observe, uh, it's important for companies and particularly from the boardroom, which is why, again, it's important for me from my perspective from a boardroom lens to be sure there are women represented at the table to be sure that there are paternity policies for example so that mm -hmm. equality does take place making sure there are equal policies uh, and we need to support companies for example that foster that mindset uh, carhartt one of my clients for example and gloria is familiar with them uh, woman president woman cmo woman um, general counsel women uh, women represent women at the hr vp so have women and this is a workwear brand where construction sites so it just <laughs> kind of almost is counterculture to what we expect and think uh with regard but women do farm work too they do construction jobs mm -hmm. so it, it, it's important to have that kind of mindset but the younger women i think are, are really more entrepreneurial they're seeing, um, expecting a lot more, they're demanding more companies. And again, that's why it's important, again, from my perspective, to make sure that these boardrooms become less male, pale, and stale. You know, and, and actually <laughs> so you did, you got it, male, pale, and stale. It <laughs> might be just as good. Might be good as, well, okay, all right, that's, all right. that's good. They won't have to beat me, though, <laughs> <laughs> on the <broadcast. laughs> so, so, so I'll come give you the last word on this. I, I just, uh, as I think about, there were two things I wanted to say to that. Number one, one of the leadership intentioning tools is believe in the infinite pie. Mm -hmm. So, oh, so that I think that really speaks to what you're what you're saying, and that is that was a really great great point, and I I, I thank you for that. Uh, I would say that what I would like for us to inculcate more, and I think it is up to us to inculcate these things into every next generation is a sense of, of responsibility to the whole and to the community. And I, I feel like there's been, um, I feel like there's been less of that in, in, as we have become a more individualistic society. And as we, frankly, as we've become a richer society, uh, there's, there's just less, uh, less of the ethos of our responsibility for each other as human beings and as a community. And uh, so, I, I can't speak to, actually I should ask my grandson over here whether that's true of the younger, of his generation, I don't know, he'll have to tell me that over dinner tonight. But I will, I, I mean, I, for me, if there's one thing I would like to really help the, every upcoming generation to understand, it is that we are all connected. Whether we like it or not, we are all connected. And, and, uh, and, and I think we have to learn that. It's not an instinctive thing. It is something that we have to learn and teach. Last word, Felicia. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think that's a great question because I, I know what I've noticed with the younger generation is they, that they are much more willing to pave their own path, to take more risks. They're not, they, they don't really look for the traditional path to going up the corporate ladder. They're willing to take risks to go out on their own. And so I would say from a corporate perspective, to definitely be willing, instead of saying you're open to innovation, be really open to innovation and letting their ideas and their voices be in the room and at the table and be willing to have them be witnessed so that they know that their ideas and their voice matters. Because I will say personally, even with my youngest daughter, she's definitely on her own path and I support whatever's gonna make her happy. I don't try to dictate how she should live her life. As long as she's happy in what she's doing, she doesn't mind going out and doing her own businesses. She's not looking for the traditional corporate path that I took. And so I would say that we have to be open knowing that if we want their voices and their innovation at the table, we've got to be willing to listen to them and have them be witness. Oh, all right, let's hear it for this fabulous panel. Um, I, I was I was going to read a, a few paragraphs to you, but I, I think it's more important for us to be able to go ahead and get to the book signing so Cindy can get back to business today. 
But what I, the, the last line of what I was going to read to you says something like this. The future is in your capable hands. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, panel. Thank you, each one of you. Thank you all so much. Keep intentioning. All right? All right. Thank you.